Welcome to Target 60, a channel where we take a realistic look at the playability of hardware old and new. Today we are looking at the playability of the W3520, Intel's first Xeon on the Bloomfield architecture, colloquially known as the i7-920 with ECC support. A quick look at Intel's own datasheet reveals the extent of the cloning taking place. The two CPUs had even cost the same. So why look at this CPU today? Well, in comparison to its retail twin, the W3520 sells for considerably less these days. Just take a look at these eBay listings. Not that either goes for much, but if you're on a tight budget, 10 versus $3 can make quite a difference. It's a 70% savings. So why did I pick this up? Well, I got this for the cost of shipping from an online forum. The user was retiring several old servers and wanted to part out the chips. Not one to pass up a good deal, I jumped on the offer and soon had this little piece of silicon at my door. I do have a fun project in mind for this that I will feature in a future video involving some gold and silver, but you'll have to wait for that one. The CPU cooler is overkill at stock, but it makes sense as I spent an evening overclocking the W3520 and got a stable 4.2 GHz from the 2.6 GHz stock clocks at a toasty 78 degrees Celsius. I think this 12 year old CPU will need every bit of help it can get today, so I'm very happy with how far this one went. It is my most successful overclock to date, and one that earned the channel the number one bench record on 3D Mark for our CPU and GPU combination. The motherboard is an EVGA X58 classified, arguably one of the best LGA 1366 boards, and this example has seen a lot of action over the years being the original home for a 990X. Let me know in the comments if you guys want to see a video on that old CPU. With support for up to 600 watts just to the CPU, 3-way SLI, and voltage readout points, I think this will be enough to max out this 920 wannabe. One of the features that made LGA 1366 so expensive was the memory, as it featured support for three channels, providing a maximum bandwidth of 25.6 gigabytes a second, quite a lot in 2008, and we'll be taking full advantage of that today with three sticks totaling 12 gigabytes. I wouldn't recommend any less than that today, or really 16 gigabytes as everything is dual channel these days, as several games took us just shy of 11 gigabytes of memory usage during benchmarking. I would have added more memory, however there was the risk the CPU wouldn't be stable given the overclock, so I opted not to. I settled on the 1050Ti for this test for two reasons. One, we know it can pass playability on a modern CPU from the 1800X video, so it'll serve as a good neutral base for this test. And two, if you are considering this CPU, a second-hand GPU like the 1050Ti might be within budget. This version here is the MSI variant, and there's nothing special about it. It just works, and we'll be leaving it at stock clocks for the testing. With a fresh installation of Windows 10, our SSD today is an older Intel model with 480GB of fully utilized storage. Test rig assembled, it's time to play some games. Our playability suite has been updated for 2020, and the games featured today will be similar from the R9-270X video with the exceptions of AC Origin, replaced with Far Cry 5, and Wreckfest standing in place for Rocket League. As a quick reminder, playability scores are a measure of consistency, not average frame rates, but that information will be provided on screen if you are interested. In order from worst to best performing games, we're starting off with Far Cry 5. The benchmark starts rough with this title, giving the W3520 its first fail of the day, with only the low quality setting offering the chance for consistent frame rates with VSync on. The CPU and GPU are equally abused here, with usage rates in the 90 percentile across both. Playability-wise, only about 60% of the frames stayed above 60, but with a low standard deviation of 3.9, one could argue for some credit here. Call of Duty Warzone continues to prove a challenging title and showed similar performance as Far Cry 5, with only the low quality settings showing average frame rates above 60, though the standard deviation was much higher at 7.2. This meant, unlike Far Cry 5, the lows dipped into the 40s and for a battle royale title shooter with intense engagements, this little CPU is going to let you down when it matters most. What a mess Minecraft testing is. It's either 1000 FPS or 20 FPS between the low and high quality settings, so I made the executive decision to change our low testing and no longer use a 2 block render distance. Our new minimum distance for this title will be 10 blocks, as in this benchmark it allowed us just enough distance to see our course and some surrounding scenery. 
As with the R9270X video, playability lies somewhere in between our medium and high presets, though when compared to the 3950X CPU, results are much closer to the medium settings here. The medium preset saw an average frame rates of 66, with a reasonable initial playability score of 83%, and the targeted frame rate setting made this much more enjoyable experience while keeping things just at that magic 60fps mark. Apex Legends did not disappoint, with healthy averages across the low, medium, and high quality settings. Playability factored in, it was really only the medium and low settings which get passing marks here, as the standard deviation across this game is rather high and even then both medium and low are best played at a target of 60 FPS as a result. F1 2019 earned impressive marks on this CPU, with all quality settings achieving playability scores over 90% without any FPS tuning. Average frame rates were equally great, and anyone with this combination of hardware could enjoy everything this game has to offer. GTA 5 is next, and after struggling with 2GB of VRAM on the R9270X in our previous video, I think the 4GB 1050Ti really helped out here and made this game enjoyable again. The W3520 contributed by driving those playability scores to passing levels and keeping our frame rates above 60. Taking a look at Fortnite next. I may not have initially enjoyed the Battle Royale concept when it first started, but with all this testing and three of the nine games we test with that focus, I'm beginning to enjoy it. Fortnite really played well on this $2 CPU, with an initial playability score of 58%, respectable averages and targeted frame rates of 60, 75, and 120 across the high, medium, and low quality settings respectively, enough to earn this CPU a final playability score of 97%. A new title for this suite, and one which I very much enjoy playing, is like Wrecking Cars and Grand Theft Auto, but better. It's Wreckfest. The W3520 really did well here, keeping everything from low to high above 100 FPS in the initial averages. The playability scores weren't so stellar initially, but after some math and some tweaking, we found a healthy compromise for frame rates at 60, 75, and 75 for targets across the high, medium, and low quality settings that gave us an overall playability score of 92%. CSGO up next, and did you really expect it not to pass with flying colors? The playability scores were initially rough as the standard deviation of frames ranged from 32 to 37, but adjusting for targeted frame rates, we improved those scores significantly to hit 98% playability with a total average frame rate across low, medium, and high settings of 130. In conclusion, I'm really impressed with this CPU. The 4.2 GHz overclocked raised my expectations, and if you can pick one of these up for an aging LGA 1366 platform you already have and then overclock it, you can enjoy modern titles in 2020. I know I'm normally a glass half empty kind of guy when it comes to these benchmarks, but I like this CPU after all was said and done, so don't give up on it if you have one and want to play this game. The CPU was hardly the bottleneck as I played these titles, and I'm curious to pair the CPU with a stronger GPU and see how far it can take us. Let me know in the comments if you want to see that. Circling back to the conclusion though, if you don't have an LGA 1366 platform lying around, I would not recommend anyone pick this up other than to make some keychains, as LGA 1366 motherboards remain expensive even in 2020. You could easily pick up an i5-2400 and motherboard for the same price if not less than an LGA-1366 combo and the 2400 would yield better performance. Thanks for watching. Consider subscribing if you'd like to see future content from the channel, and hit that like button if you enjoyed.